Okay, hi everybody and uh, welcome to our monthly BCAC Youth Learning Series webinar. I will be your host, Alicia. We have a very special guest today who has made quite a name for herself in the aviation industry. So we're very lucky to have her talking to you all today about the future of aviation and what it might look like. We will be diving into a couple different topics such as human factors and aviation sustainability and how, that's, how they both have been affected by COVID-19. She will also be talking about her international involvement with the next generation of aviation professionals, which explores strategy to attract and educate and retain people in aviation. For those that missed our last two webinars, you can watch them both via the uh, links on the BCAC website under the resources tab. Um, if you do have any questions for Dr. Kearns, please submit them into the chat and we will try and get through as many as we can. Also, if you have any webinar topic suggestions, please leave them in the comment um, please leave a comment in the chat or email us at info at bcaviationcouncil.org. Uh, and before we get started, a quick reminder that the webinar will be recorded and to please turn off your microphones. Thank you. So Dr. Suzanne Kearns is not only a geography and aviation professor at the University of Waterloo, she is also an author. She has written several books or several aviation books over the last 10 years and has a passion for supporting the international next generation of aviation professionals program and global aviation training initiatives with ICAO. As a professor, her research is primarily focused on aviation safety, training methodologies and human factors. So please welcome Dr. Suzanne Kearns. Thank you, Alicia. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you all today and for um, again a huge thanks for what the BCAC is doing to support the next generation. I think this is something that a lot of the time our industry has expected to kind of happen automatically and seeing people step up and invest in supporting people's interest in aviation and helping them navigate this industry is something that I think is really important. Uh, so I'm going to start my slides. Uh, maybe let me know if, um, if they're working. I'll share my screen. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see them okay? Okay, good. <laughs> good. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you today about, some of it is uh, based on my research, uh, some of it is based on best guesses, and some of it is, is based on what I hope the future might look like for aviation in Canada. So I'm gonna walk through a little bit about this, but ultimately we're talking about sustainability and, and innovation, specifically strategies for what we can do to craft a future for ourselves in Canada, uh, Canadian aviation. So before we talk about what the future looks like, I think it's really helpful to reflect back on where we were at the start of this year. So if you look back, if you can think, it seems like it's 10 years ago, but if we look back eight months ago to January of 2020, the reality is that you can think of sort of the three biggest challenges facing our industry are what's included on the slide. So we saw a real uprising in issues around the environmental sustainability of aviation. So we saw, um, you know, Greta Thunberg really popularized the, the flight shaming movement, where a lot of people were pointing to aviation as a polluter and really questioning what we were going to do to um, you know, reduce the emissions that were produced through our aviation activities. So that created a, a huge amount of attention. And if you, if you understand what ICAO is, so ICAO being the International Civil Aviation Organization, they're the special agency of the United Nations where the world comes together to make uh, regulations, basically standards of recommended practices that are the foundation for regulations around the world. But they have an assembly once every three years where the whole world comes together. And in September of 2019, uh, Greta Thunberg actually led a movement, like a huge climate march outside of ICAO headquarters in Montreal during their assembly. So there's been a huge focus at ICAO and internationally on what we can do to manage um, environmental sustainability. But if you think back in January of this year, the reality is that we, um, we were experiencing and projecting tremendous growth. So in Canada alone, we were expecting that the number of flights in a given day would double in the next 15 years. So when you look at something like environmental sustainability and you see these the growth projections that the industry is gonna double, it becomes a really hard problem to solve. And that flows into the next point, which was personnel shortages. So also in January, one of the biggest challenges from a pilot training perspective was that instructors were being hired so quickly and were moving into airlines so quickly that there was a tremendous shortage of flight instructors, which disrupts the entire uh, pipeline of talent that flows into our sector. 
So there was a lot of attention as well. And how can we uh, encourage more people to join our industry? How can we increase the capacity of our training resources? And how can we make sure that we're supporting them as they transition from an educational environment into the workforce itself? And the last point there is in technology. So we're seeing like a, a real rapid evolution of technologies in aviation, uh, everything from electric aircraft to the integration of drones to um, different types of navigation equipment that are satellite based navigation that allow for you know, more direct flight paths. There's a lot of new integration of technology, but with it comes additional challenges. Like how do you ensure cybersecurity? How do you ensure that the human who sits in the center of that complex system understands enough about how it all works so that they can manage it safely without causing additional challenges or issues? So let's think about, the, this is where we started. Uh, now we have to switch to sort of the, <laughs> the sadder story, which is around the pandemic itself. So everyone knows that COVID-19 has disrupted aviation in a way that we've never seen before in any of our lifetimes, uh, right to the edge of the breaking point. So the absolute first priority, so everything else I'm gonna talk about after this is sort of how we can chart a sustainable future through a recovery period, but for the industry to survive the pandemic itself, the most important thing is that we continue to ask for both the support of people in our families uh, to be supportive of our industry, as well as government and regulators to be supportive of our industry, because without sort of direct interventions from governments, whether it's financial or I know Transport Canada today put out some guidance, uh, I think it's called Canada's flight plan about how we can help ensure public health measures throughout the entire air transport network. All of those things are the most important things. So absolutely, this, you know, getting through the pandemic in a way where industry survives and is still healthy is the number one priority. But the next part is sort of like, what do we do after that? Because the reality is, while our industry has kind of pressed the pause button, it does create an opportunity for us to think about those challenges that were facing us at the beginning of the year. Those three main challenges, we didn't have the capacity or the people or the resources to really address them. We're kind of scrambling. We're, we were playing sort of catch up with all of those big issues in a way that could be very difficult for us to, to manage them. So what I would argue and what the rest of this presentation is about is, of course, supporting the survival of our industry is number one, but while uh, the regulators and the industries and the operators are working towards that as the number one goal, and the most important goal. The second part is how can the rest of us use this time, this pause to constructively innovate, to craft a more sustainable future for a post pandemic recovery. And if you look at the impact of aviation, it's really clear that this transportation network plays a really critical role in supporting economic recovery. So we want to make sure that we're using this time wisely as best as we possibly can. So this uh, graph was from my textbook. So I wrote a new edition of my textbook during the pandemic. And so you can see that the numbers have been updated. Um, but what's important for under to understand, especially if you are new to the industry or a student, is that aviation is what's considered a cyclical industry. So aviation has always been and will probably always be very directly impacted by economic upswings and downturns. Even though the last 10 years we've had uh, profits, sort of solid 10 years of profits in our industry, if you look further back, you'll see that it's not uh, out of the question to see downturns in aviation. So if you look at the graph, I know that the bar covers it up at the bottom, but you can see the downturn in 2001, which was the repercussions of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. You can see the downturn in 2008 because there was a major financial crisis as well. Uh, both of those are matched with a recovery. So sometimes you see the steep uh, V-shaped recovery where the recovery matches the same slope as the downturn. Uh, sometimes recoveries are more U-shaped where there is sort of a, a more sustained uh, downturn and then it takes longer to recover. Um, the reality is unquestionably this year with the pandemic and basically halting aviation entirely has resulted in um, losses like we've never seen before. That's certain, but what's also certain is that there will be some form of a recovery eventually. And what we can do now during this pause time is to think about how we support a more sustainable future when that recovery does come. So ultimately, I think uh, my, my number one message is that we can't solve these future challenges by relying on the solutions of the past. So the way that we've always historically done things has led us into that situation where we had this tremendous growth and we had you know, these major challenges 
associated with the growth that weren't easily easy to fix or easy to address. Um, so I'm going to challenge you all uh, to think about some of these suggestions. You might not agree with all of my suggestions, and that's okay too. I'm sort of interested in feedback and what everyone else thinks as well. Uh, but I'm going to walk you through some of what I think are real key priorities that our industry needs to lean into if we are going to craft a more sustainable future together. Um, so I suggest that the first challenge, so of those three that I pointed out at the beginning, was around environmental sustainability. Uh, if you look at this graph, uh, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not when I move it, but um, you can see this line here represents carbon neutral growth from 2020 onwards. So ICAO has done a really great job in sort of addressing directly the environmental impacts of aviation. And what they had suggested was in order to sort of limit the negative impacts of emissions from aviation, that what they were going to do was only support carbon neutral growth from the year 2020 onwards. So basically that the emissions produced from our sector after offset offsets would never exceed the levels from 2020. Um, interestingly, of course, because 2020 was a year when there wasn't a whole lot of aviation happening, that didn't make a whole lot of sense because you don't want this benchmark to be artificially low and then the future of our sector will never be able to sort of operate normally because there's this artificial benchmark. So uh, the, the ICAO Council agreed to use the 2019 level, uh, so it's going to be carbon neutral growth from 2019 onwards. But the way the carbon neutral growth is going to be accomplished is through, it's called a basket of measures, as you can see along the bottom. So it's a combination of both operational improvements. So we're seeing like more direct flight paths so that we can uh, reduce the fuel burn. Uh, new aircraft technologies, so lighter weight aircraft and more efficient engines, uh, as well as Corsia, which is our basically our carbon marketplace for aviation, where, um, for example, if an airline was flying and they produce too many emissions, then they would invest financially in other initiatives that take carbon out of the atmosphere. So maybe they're planting trees or they're um, investing in clean energy. Uh, and the other is sustainable fuels. So the idea is that through all of these efforts or through operational improvements, uh, new technologies, Corsia, so carbon offsetting, and these sustainable fuels, that is how the future of our industry had planned to maintain uh, our emissions or cap them so that they would never exceed the levels in now 2019. But a lot of what I'd like to talk about in this presentation is around the concept of sustainability. I think a lot of the time when people think sustainability, they think just about environmental impacts. Um, and that's an important part of it. So definitely that's one of the three pillars like you'll see on your slide. But sustainability, I think, is easier to understand if you think about the definition that sustainability is about meeting the needs of the present without sacrificing future generations' ability to meet their needs. So in addition to focusing on the environmental impacts of aviation, you also have to look at the two other pillars, which are social and economic. Uh, sometimes these pillars of sustainability are called the three Ps. It's people, profit, and planet. Um, but without any one of these three factors and the industry isn't sustainable. And so this is kind of the, I think the easiest way to understand sustainability because if you think about it, the only way to completely eliminate emissions from aviation would be to experience what we've all lived through in the last five months is to kind of stop and halt all aviation. But when you do that, if you look at the social impact, you know, people are stuck where they are. People can't visit family and friends. Uh, businesses can't do business. It, it halts trade and disrupts trade. And ultimately it puts hundreds of thousands of people out of work. So it has tremendously negative impacts on people and economically likewise as well. And it causes uh, tremendous losses as well. So what we wanna think about to promote sustainability is really trying to find the balance between those three factors. So we want businesses to be profitable. We wanna support people's movements and support people as they move around the world, giving them uh, worthwhile jobs and quality education, but we also want to minimize any negative uh, environmental impacts as well. And I think we can say that looking back to January of 2020, that our industry was really not sustainable. We weren't perfectly finding that balance. There was some sort of um, inequality between some of those factors. Um, even if you look at some of the, the social aspects of our industry, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that, you know, there's a, a significant minority of pilots or women. Uh, we have uh, sort of less people of color than should be representative of, of our population. That uh, there are a lot of sort of demographic issues in our industry that don't really represent our society. Um, likewise, if you think about supporting the people as well, um, there's a lot of issues around pilot mental health. 
things like pilots aren't getting support for counseling or depression or other mental health issues because of fear of losing a medical. Um, but the reality is what we've been through with this pandemic exacerbates all of that. There was a story in the media just a few days ago of a pilot who had lost their job because of the pandemic who committed suicide because of that. So the reality is we need to really carefully and strategically invest in finding the sustainable balance where we're supporting our people. Companies are profitable and making money and we're not sort of hurting the environment in the process. So you may or may not have seen these. These are the SDGs. So if you think about like that was the problem, what's the solution? Uh, I would suggest that our industry needs to really strategically lean into supporting sustainable development goals or the SDGs. The SDGs were produced and supported by the United Nations, uh, 17 goals to support a sustainable future for everyone around the world. Not all of them maybe relate exactly to aviation or are impacted by aviation, but many of them are. So whether it's good health and well-being. So there are some really interesting stories of charities like Orbis and Orbis uses a, an aircraft that has been completely redesigned as a flying eye hospital and they fly into developing parts of the world and train eye doctors how to perform all sorts of different surgeries and they've cured billions of cases of blindness around the world. Uh, quality education is a really important part uh, of the SDGs and of course part of, important part of aviation as well. Uh, gender equality is something we need to strive for as well supporting clean energy, uh, industry and infrastructure, reducing inequalities. Uh, I'm not gonna read them all to you because I know you can all read the SDGs, but I think that we need to really, as I said, lean in and support sustainable goals or SDGs as a critical pillar of what aviation stands for. Um, ICAO already does this. So because ICAO is a special agency of the United Nations, the SDGs are, are one of their main priorities and they're incredibly supportive of these factors already. Um, I just think it needs to filter down into uh, our operational practices. That it needs to be something that people are aware of and supportive of. And again, it's all about finding this balance where we have healthy people, we have healthy companies, and we have a healthy environment. So if you look at challenge two, so the, the global personnel shortage, uh, I'm going to sort of go back a little bit in time and give you a bit of history. Uh, NGAP or NGAP stands for the next generation of aviation professionals. So back in 2009, uh, several people were looking to the future of our industry and recognizing that we didn't have enough personnel to support the growth. Uh, by most projections, the number of professionals that were needed to support our industry, if we were on the same growth trajectory we were in January, uh, would exceed the global training capacity. So ultimately, you can project like how big airlines are going to get and how quickly they're going to grow because they place their orders like with Boeing and Airbus you know, many years in advance. Um, so we have these estimates of where we're headed. And the reality is, like I said, the entire global training capacity, so the entire world's training organizations working towards producing people was unlikely to be able to produce enough to support that sector. So it's a real critical issue to start thinking strategically about like, how do we get people in? How do we train them as efficiently as possible? And how do we retain them in our industry? In 2015, ICAO upgraded the initiative to an official program and it was sort of named a global priority for the industry. And ultimately the vision is to support global aviation to have sufficient competent human resources to support a safe, secure and sustainable air transport system. But I think everyone can kind of think in your own life, what happens when you are short on people? Right. So say you whether you're a student and you have a group project or if you're in a company, if you know that it's really hard to find anybody else to join your team and to help you, you might be more flexible to maybe deal with somebody who's not the best at their job or who's difficult to work with or maybe they're cutting corners or, or doing things not in the best way. So it's a typical like bad apple kind of a situation. So a global personnel shortage has ripple effects in a negative way throughout the entire industry. It does have uh, safety implications. It does have uh, capacity implications as well. Um, in the summer of 2019, we were seeing in Canada, a lot of flights getting canceled because there wasn't sufficient crew to, uh, to operate those flights. So it has economic impacts as well. So the NGAP program, so the Next Generation of Aviation Professionals program with ICAO, it has three, uh, three main aspects to it as well. So it's about attracting people. So if you think about anybody who's on the call or anybody who works in the industry, you can probably think back in your own experience to something that triggered your interest in aviation. Maybe it was the museum or an air show or you watched a movie and it was really cool, like whatever it happens to be, something along the line probably 
made you think like, hey, that's a pretty cool career. I think I might be interested in, in pursuing that. And the attract pillar of this is about deliberately and strategically creating those opportunities. So there are some great programs in Canada like um, uh, the outreach programs that support the next generation. Um, those are really important. That's really critical work. I think what BCAAC is doing to support the next generation is a great example of that as well. Um, but the next thing to that is the education piece. So I've been an aviation professor for 16 years, and we've seen significant growth in our program in the last four or five years. We've seen our numbers go up about 40% every year. Um, so at the University of Waterloo, when I started there, it was previously at Western, we had an, um, an incoming class of about 30, and this year we have an incoming class of about 155. So it's been growing every single year. So this is really important because the efforts to attract people to join our industry don't actually translate to more professionals unless we increase our educational capacity. So we need more spots. We need, we need to do that education piece better uh, in a more, a more efficient and a more strategic way. Uh, a lot of this is also about educational research. So a lot of my research is in competency-based training, which instead of traditional aviation training and licensing, which is based on hours, it uses a demonstration of competency as a metric for when you're finished training and can be licensed and can move on. So it also includes, includes a um, more significant impact of uh, flight simulation uh, within that process as well. So there's a lot that can be done to both increase the capacity of our education network as well as to teach more effectively. Uh, and the last piece is retention. So I think also anybody who works in aviation probably also knows people who have chosen to leave the industry for one reason or another, whether it's you know women pursuing a family or it's um, people not feeling welcome or uh, they don't jive with the culture of their company. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for this, but every time somebody leaves our industry after they've already been attracted and educated into the industry, you can think about the, all of the touch points along the way. So teachers and educators and equipment and resources and all of the things that have been invested in that person, if they get to the very end and they leave the industry, that that's a tremendous waste as well. So we want to uh, reduce the attrition. We want to support a diverse and inclusive workforce. So we want to make sure everybody feels welcome. So we don't have sort of like, you know, if you're not part of the club, then I'm really going to give you a hard time here at work. Like that's something that needs to be completely eliminated from our industry. And the last one is that ensuring that every learner who is capable of achieving competence is supported. So it's kind of this idea that there used to be this idea in the industry with training that like if you can't learn the way I teach you, well, don't let the door hit you on the way out because there's 50 people lined up outside the door who could take your spot. Um, the reality is in January of this year, you know, maybe we will get back to it's not obviously the how it is today because of the pandemic, but I, as of January of this year, the reality is there was not that lineup of people outside the door waiting and fighting their way in to get into the classroom. So the industry needs to sort of rethink how we teach and say, like, if you learn a little bit differently, or maybe you've mastered this element and you haven't mastered this element, well, maybe I'm going to allow you to have a little extra time, take it away from this other thing you've already mastered, so you can have a little bit more personalization of your education. Um, it's sort of, I think, historically in aviation, we've expected people to fit inside a box in their educational process, and if they didn't fit, then we saw them as failing out. Uh, I'm not saying extend the timeline of training indefinitely. I'm just saying use that time specifically tailored to that individual's needs. So attract, educate, and retain are sort of the three pillars of NGAP. So in March of this year, which is sort of funny timing because it's like right when the pandemic hit. Um, so I had a new book come out called Engaging the Next Generation of Aviation Professionals, or we call it NGAP, E-N-G-A-P. Um, this is sort of my effort to say that I think that this is an emerging field in aviation. Uh, and anybody who's been in the industry for a while, you probably know of human factors. Human factors is sort of the study of human limitations of so things like fatigue and workload management, situation awareness, all these human issues that pilots deal with, and as well as maintenance and everybody else who works in aviation as well. And what, the way I explain it is that human factors hasn't always been a part of our industry. Human factors emerged from an industry need so in the late 1970s, there were a series of very high profile aviation accidents directly caused by uh, human error. So people made seemingly obvious mistakes that they shouldn't have made. And uh, there was a lot of questions in the industry about why is this happening and what can we do to reduce this issue? So um, amazingly, 
and the industry came together with academia and regulators and NASA in the United States held a symposium in 1979 and that led to you know, crew resource management or CRM training which we now have as mandatory for most aviation professionals every year. So the reality is that the industry recognized a need, they grouped together to try to address that need and then they uh, created a new intervention that could address it on a wide scale. And I think that the issues that we're facing in aviation, a lot of them are kind of these um, hard to define issues around things like diversity and inclusion or education or retention, human resources issues. Like there's all these kind of things that everybody knows they're important, but they don't fit together. They don't fit in any category of what we've previously defined as important in aviation. Um, and so what I think is going to happen is that we're going to see this new NGAP issue as actually a new sort of sub-discipline of research and inquiry that is applied to aviation. The reality is it's not all brand new. A lot of the questions that we're facing and dealing with have already been addressed in other parallel industries. So you can see them listed on the slide. Uh, this book was an edited volume, which means that I was the editor and I asked people around the world to contribute. And we had about 50 different authors, uh, both academics and professionals, contribute case studies and chapters uh, around this issue. So it was sort of the first, um, the first really work in the industry sort of from an academic sense to try to address this issue but it came out at a really terrible time. <laughs> I actually haven't received this book yet because it was mailed to the university, which is now completely locked up and closed. And so I assume that it's there. I've seen pictures that the book exists, but I haven't actually held it yet. Maybe one day. Um, so what does this look like? So again, I sort of said there's all these sort of a variety of disciplines that haven't always previously uh, been attached to aviation, human resources, uh, augmented and virtual reality. So these immersive learning tools that are developing through new technologies. How do we reach out and encourage people to join our industry? How do we support the regulators in crafting modern regulations that are really reflective of best practice and science and evidence about how people learn and how their skills are retained or decay over time? Uh, economic factors and sustainability. Uh, one that I've been more personally connected to is establishing a common core for aviation education. So. I wrote a textbook, which I just finished the second edition of, but it's in translations all over the world. Uh, it's called Fundamentals of International Aviation. And uh, it's meant to be a common core because one of the issues, if you think about NGAP, is that retention piece. So anybody who's on the call, if you're a professional, whether you're a pilot or maintenance or air traffic controller, the old way of teaching people to be an aviation professional is you learn just about your job. So you learn to be like a pilot in Canada or an air traffic controller in the United States. And then once you're active as a professional and you start working, you start to learn about a lot of the other jobs that are also in the industry, as well as how your job is different in other countries. So how, you know, if you're a pilot in Canada, how pilots in Europe, how their, their work life is a little bit different and their regulatory system is a little bit different. So my, um, one of my main goals was to think about, well, what if we flip that upside down? What if we started aviation education with a common core that introduces young people to a broad cross-section of all the different careers in aviation. And sort of the purpose of that being twofold, that both young people could decide which they like best, like what speaks to them the most, and then self-select their career as they move forward. Uh, but the second part to that is that if their first choice doesn't work out, they lose their medical certificate if they decide they don't like that job or they don't like the the work the lifestyle of it that they have this sort of broad awareness so maybe instead of say you, you lose your medical as a pilot maybe instead of leaving aviation entirely you can look in a parallel field and say you know i think airport management is pretty cool i think i'm going to work there but that would allow us to retain them within aviation so sort of this lateral transitions of people um, so that's something i'm a little bit more passionate about than some of the other factors so it's been interesting since the pandemic hit uh, how people have responded to that book because uh, initially I was thinking, gosh, this is the worst timing ever because <laughs> everything we had said that made sense when we published it now doesn't make sense anymore because the whole world ground to a halt. But one of the contributors to that book, a, a man named Simon Witz out of the UK, he said um, sort of what I've come to be very supportive of as well is that you know, this is the time we need to actually implement changes. This is the time we need to think things through and really take advantage of this pause in operations to critically reflect on how we've been doing things and how we can craft a more sustainable future for our sector. So he sort of, NGAP being the acronym for the book, so engaging the next generation of aviation professionals, 
So we've had a lot of conversations about um, how we can support this. And so he's actually established NGAP UK with an idea that it's a focal point for the entire United Kingdom for all of the existing entities that are already involved in attracting, educating and retaining to be able to come together to share best practices and resources. And, uh, and that's been really interesting as we've been moving forward and I'll show you a little bit more. So what, with what he's done is he sort of looked at each of these three pillars. So for attract, educate and retain, so the attract includes, you know, museums, uh, learned industry societies, STEM organizations, charities, and employers, and the education piece as well. Again, it's the universities and colleges and schools and training, but it's the employers as well, because we want to make sure that uh, when we're teaching people to be aviation professionals, that we're doing that in partnership with the people who are going to actually hire them. We don't want somebody to be taught, graduate, start a job, and somebody for the first day of the job to say like, well, now forget everything you learned in school and I'll teach you how the job's really done. Like we need to close that gap between teaching and the work itself. And then retention, so employers, uh, grad schools and learned societies. Um, there are a lot of others as well, but the reality is you can take all of the players that currently exist in the country and you can map them into who is already doing this work around attracting, educating and retaining and then not replacing anybody's efforts, but just creating a mechanism for them to be able to talk to each other. And I think that's a real critical aspect of how we can support a more sustainable future for our sector. So one of the things I've been looking at is how we can create uh, NGAP Canada uh, around the same pillars. And it's early days and early stages, um, but this is something that I hope in the future can be a resource, again, not to replace any of the amazing work that's already happening, but just uh, to, as a forum to bring people together so that we can uh, avoid stepping on each other's toes and duplicating efforts. We can continue to build on each other, but also to network internationally, both uh, with ICAO, but also with NGAP UK. And there are several other countries who are looking at starting up their own uh, NGAP branch as well. So NGAP Canada would have a focal point on Canada, but international connections to learn lessons from other countries as well. Um, and this has been a, a really interesting process and I, I do hope that it is something uh, that does support our sector as we move forward. So the third challenge I wanted to sort of brief more briefly touch on is the idea of technology. So the reality is one of the other reasons we can't continue teaching the way we've already always taught is because technology is changing a lot of the aspects of, of our aviation system. So as we see the increased integration of electric aircraft, of drones, uh, autonomous or self-flying aircraft as well, uh, new avionics and air traffic management technologies, new materials, um, major questions around cybersecurity. I always tell my students, like, think about all the security effort that go into screening passengers as they go through an airport. And if you think about a drone, like, obviously, they don't have that same protection from a security perspective. So you have to think really critically about security impacts as we adopt new technologies and integrate them into our airspace. So we need to really think about how do we do this? How do we keep pace with technologies? And the reality is Canada already has world leading experts in all of these fields. So we have some of the best computer scientists, we have some of the best engineers, like we are extremely well positioned from our academic standpoint to address a lot of these issues. But the challenge is that there isn't a mechanism for industry and academia to come together to work together collaboratively to solve some of these issues. So uh, the other factor is the government. So Transport Canada, that we need to work directly with them so that if they need evidence around well, you know, whether a new regulation is safe or, uh, or efficient, that they have a mechanism where they can leverage against academia and say, conduct a study on this and, and help me answer some of these questions. Let's produce research and evidence to support the sector. So one of the sort of the, the third main things that I want to suggest for our future is that we need to very strategically craft um, strategies that mobilize Canada's strengths in a way that can support the future of our sector. So what I would propose, and again, at this point, it's just an idea. Um, it's something that is very open as well to uh, other people's thoughts and, and what it might look like. But I would suggest we need uh, what you can call it a center of excellence. Um, ultimately, it's just a, a, a central point where all of the different aspects of aviation can come together to try to solve problems to support the sector. So it would involve uh, educational partners, uh, as well as NGAP UK has a new uh, International Air and Space Training Institute, which is directly involved with this work as well. So this would be the Canadian equivalent um, of that. Uh, multidisciplinary research, where we are using sort of these NGAP Canada theories of you know academic uh, 
areas that haven't previously been applied to aviation, but also other types of research as well. Uh, industry needs to be directly involved. So right before the pandemic hit, uh, I had worked to craft a um, we call it an aviation research cluster at the University of Waterloo, where we have about 20 different faculty from all different uh, aspects of the university who were starting to apply their research to aviation. And we had plans in an, a, a day on campus where we wanted to bring industry partners to campus and have sort of the researchers present and the industry present the problems and facilitate a matchmaking process so we can start to help industry get their questions answered by the best and cutting edge researchers. Um, we want to include Transport Canada. Again, that's a real critical part as well. Uh, continually assessing and testing and exploring new technologies, making sure that nothing sort of gets into the industry until we know it's safe and secure and efficient, and always sort of prioritizing a sustainable future. So ultimately, um, so I'm almost at my presentation, but the reality is that a sustainable air transport sector is going to be a critical component of our post-pandemic recovery. As I said at the beginning, and to reiterate, the number one priority is making sure our industry survives. So some of the really important work happening with our government and transport to you know, maintain public health and to economically support operators so they survive this crazy time is the most important thing. But then the rest of us, while we have resources and time and availability to think about crafting a more sustainable future for our sector. No one person or group can solve these challenges alone. It's only really through mobilizing both uh, across sectors. So again, it's not just pilots, it's not just controllers, it's not just airports or maintenance, it's everybody working together in the most effective way possible, both domestically and internationally, prioritizing sustainability and focusing on innovation. And as one example of that, I want to just quickly share what's happening in the UK and their medical field. So if you wanted to, for example, become a surgeon in the United Kingdom, what the sector has done is they've created a, a very distinct ladder starting from the time you are a school as you know, a child in school, all the way through to all of your educational pathways and options. And the reality is, if you want to become an aviation professional in Canada, a lot of the time, you know, you're a 16, 17 year old young person and the industry, we expect you to be able to navigate and identify the best pathway to enter our field. We're not providing that structure for them. But if you think about like what something like this could produce, one of the first things I would suggest would be creating um, a sector ladder. So we can have like a really distinct way to understand from a common core, if you wanna be an air traffic controller or airport manager or pilot or maintenance engineer, you can see what paths and what choices you have to take and it can be supported fully along the sector. But it also helps in other ways too. Like if you were a maintenance engineer in another country and you come to Canada, there are some real limitations to getting your credentials in Canada because we still require maintenance engineers to know about like cloth wings, for example. And so if you've maybe worked for 20 or 30 years in another country and come to Canada, you often do have to go back to college and kind of start over again. But if we have the sector ladder, like we have these really defined pathways from very beginning into jobs, you could see somebody who's a transitioning professional or an immigrant coming in and seeing like where their skill set maps onto our system and how to integrate them into our air transport sector as well. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to it. It's interesting. It's sort of a, an academic exploration. So this is like a dream. This is where I hope we go. I think it could have tremendous impacts, but at this point, it's still in the early days. So thank you to the BCAC and to all of you for your attention. I'm happy to connect with you to discuss further if you have any questions. And I'll stop sharing my screen if there are, are any questions. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kearns, for touching on all those uh, different topics and sharing a new perspective on things. Uh, I'm glad to hear that the next generation is still persevering through these challenging times. And just remember, everybody, that we're all in this together and to, to stay positive. Um, a good thing about our industry, like you had talked upon, is that our industry is very dynamic. And uh, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see um, what comes into effect as a result of COVID. Um, so now we'll jump into some questions. We got a bunch from the audience, so I'll just pull those up now. Um, the first question we have for you um, is, as a graduate student of aviation management, how can I improve myself in the aviation safety and human factors? Um, yeah, so it kind of depends. So if you've already have a master's degree and you're looking at what to do next or what to come, what comes next, um, there's a few choices. So if you want to pursue a PhD, you can do so. There are very distinct differences between Canadian and American PhD programs. So um, you 
will be very unlikely to find a, a part-time uh, PhD program in Canada because usually uh, what happens is you in Canada you have to find a supervisor whose research is aligned with your interests and they will fund you and so they have to have funding to support you uh, but in the United States if you look at a variety of different universities like Ember Riddle or Purdue uh, I think Ohio State as well you'll see some really great universities that have graduate programs and a lot of them do have flexibility if you're interested in PhD. If you don't want to go that far, uh, you could look at uh, short courses like from uh, IATA, the International Air Transport Association, ACI, Airports Council International or ICAO. Um, they do have a variety of sort of maybe online uh, shorter term courses. So, um, and the reality is you can get a lot of the learning you need just from a book. So if you're not wanting sort of a um, a certificate. If you just really want to improve yourself and, and that's what matters to you, um, then there's a lot of options to just look for sort of good quality academic uh, aviation books and you can learn a lot on your own. Awesome. Okay. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, hello, Dr. Kern. I am a senior aviation management student that is currently trying to enter the industry. You spoke briefly in the beginning of the presentation about students' transi transition from education to industry. What advice and recommendations could you give that will help us enter the market and find internships or job opportunities? Thank you for everyone and, and what you do in the, in, for the aviation. Well, thank you for joining our industry. I think all of you who are sort of at the end of your education and just joining, um, I can speak from the students that I work with that they've only ever known an industry that was in surplus. And so they've received a message for like the last, you know, four years that there's this tremendous shortage of professionals and there's gonna be so many opportunities for you. And because they haven't lived through downturns before, like in 2008 or, or 2001, that I know it really felt like they got the rug pulled out from under them. So I think first off, just know that aviation is filled with a lot of passionate people who have uh, unfortunately lived through downturns before. So anybody like my age or older, you, you, like we, we've had hard times. And when I was um, going through my undergrad, I wanted to be an airline pilot. And I finished all my flight training and credentials and uh, the 9-11 happened. And so that changed everything. So all of these people with you know massive student loans and debts were waiting tables for minimum wage. And, and so I went back and I got my master's in, in human factors and then eventually came back to Canada and was working as a prof and then I did my PhD as well. I never planned to be a professor. Like I wasn't a kid who was like, I can't wait to be an academic and read books forever. Like that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't, that wasn't the plan. Um, so what I would just suggest to you is don't let this downturn affect your positivity. Like try to maintain your passion for aviation. Try to focus on the idea that we will recover. And when we do, the industry will need you. You will have to be you know, a critical part of us surviving and, and that support is going to be really important. But in the meantime, I would just suggest that think about think about pivots, like don't take a step back, but maybe the, pl the path that you had planned isn't going to work out. It's not going to be a straight line, but maybe there's something if you look a little bit to the left or the right that you hadn't previously considered, but maybe it makes sense now. So I would just suggest do what you can to keep moving forward during this time so that when we do recover that you're in the best position possible to re-engage with our sector. Uh, whatever that happens to be for you. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. Um, we've got another one. Uh, what do you see as the biggest driver slash catalyst for enabling sustainability in aviation? Would it be from government, uh, example, international slash federal or from the market? Uh, right now, I'm seeing a push sort of from the top and the bottom. So I see like ICAO and the international regulators pushing down, uh, you know, all sorts of different standards uh, around environmental protection, uh, which is really, really important. And you're seeing a lot of companies step up and embrace this. But a lot of people like me, the industry we grew up in wasn't exactly environmentally minded like it, it was sort of something that wasn't really talked about if you were you know we almost would be like oh you're a tree hugger like we had no concept of environmental protection when i was a student going through school uh so it's something that my generation is learning about like we have to shift into it and lean into it in a, in a different way so when i say the top i mean like the international regulators but it's also the bottom because i'm seeing this huge integration of young people who prioritize and really care about environmental protection like you're raised in a way that you you value and support it so, so i in, in my classes 
um, it's different because, you know, people who love aviation started to have this kind of embarrassment saying like, um, I, I'm kind of don't want to tell people that I love aviation because my friends say it's a polluter and, and they said like, I shouldn't like it, that I shouldn't be, be a, you know, a, an aviation nerd or whatever you happen to be. So, um, so I, you know, last year in my class would sort of give them a lot of statistics and say, well, look at it from a sustainability perspective. It's not just about the environmental impacts. It's also about the many good things that aviation does around the world. It, it supports hundreds of thousands of jobs and, and it supports uh, economies and it helps bring resources to people in ways that they, that are, are absolutely critical to their survival. So I don't want anybody to ever be embarrassed about aviation, but I think that the young people really are sort of re-educating aspects of our industry to say that this is a priority that we care about and that we do need to lean into it. So I think that like my generation's probably done the worst sort of being in the middle because I think we're sort of are in that mindset like, oh, it's not, it's not as big a deal maybe, or we're having to learn more, or educate ourselves about why it really is important. And so that's why I think the suggestion of sustainability is, is sort of the most logical next step. It's sort of this, this three pillar balance we're trying to hold on to and appreciate and value and promote all of the really good things about our industry, but also accept there are some not so good things about our industry and we need to focus our energy and trying to reduce those negative impacts as much as we can. Awesome. Uh, next one we've got, uh, can you comment on your view, viewpoint of the massive developments of urban air mobility, e, uh, VTOLS, mm -hmm. and the move to electric and hydrogen fuel cell propulsion systems for aviation? Yeah, so I'm not an expert in this, like I'm more of an expert on the human side of sort of education human factors, but I can say that they're really cool. Like if, uh, when I was at, um, so ICAO has a variety of different events, like, uh, and so last year I went to one at outside of ICAO headquarters, they had one of the models, which was a sort of a VTOL, it was either a quadcopter or, or more, but it was at least a quadcopter, but it had no cockpit. So it was like completely autonomous. So it's like a Jetsons era kind of vehicle where, you know, it was like, an, like the equivalent of like an Uber, it would sort of land outside your house and you would get in and it would fly you in an automatic sense to where you're going. Uh, I know there's also been some really amazing work around unmanned traffic management and taking some really detailed mapping of urban environments that would allow for, you know, really to like a, a fine degree of detail, those types of aircraft to navigate through a cityscape. So this is one of those things where I talk about like innovation and the need for getting some of the best experts we have in the country to start applying some of their innovation towards aviation because not not any aviation expert can be an expert in every facet of, of where we're going um, and so I think we need to be very collaborative and inclusive in where we're going um, and as well as like hydrogen I know like if you look at electric aircraft one of the I'm sure everybody knows this but one of the major challenges with electric aircraft is the weight of the batteries and how it limits the range of those types of aircraft so you see like Harbor Air in BC which has done a really cool job uh, using electric aircraft uh, for seaplanes because it's shorter runs. So it's feasible uh, based on the type of flying that they're doing. Uh, but right now, today, we wouldn't see like a transport category aircraft using electric power because the weight of the batteries itself would so greatly limit the range that it wouldn't be feasible for where we're going. So yeah, new batteries, new power, like that's gonna be something that changes the game for the future of our industry. But again, it's that technology factor, which is uh, beyond the, the range of my expertise as well. So yeah, somebody else had mentioned another comment about Harbor, so it's nice that you kind of touched upon that too. That was pretty exciting. I remember mm -hmm. seeing the photos when they did their first flight. That was really cool. Yeah. Um, so thank you for your comments about instruction and attracting and retaining students. Can you comment on the pipeline of students uh, becoming instructors with ambition to jump as quickly as possible to the airlines? As a CPL student in college, in a college flight program, the drain of instructors and the experience levels of my instructors has been, has been a significant factor in my journey towards becoming a commercial pilot. Any thoughts on the instructor shortage and how industry could be training better and retaining quality instructors longer? Yeah, so, okay. So this is my personal rant. So I'm just gonna do it quickly so I don't take up everybody's time. I think that if you look at parallel fields, like really high technology, safety critical fields like medicine, like nuclear power, like whatever it happens to be, if you were to go to those professionals and say, 
So I got a great idea for how you're going to get your instructors. You're going to take your newest grads, like the ones who just literally finished and remake them the teachers. And they would laugh at you and they would say, what a ridiculous concept. And then you'll say, not only that, I'm going to pay those uh, instructors minimum wage and, uh, and sort of basically do everything I can to incentivize them to move on as quickly as possible. That doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't know how it happened in our industry where we sort of devaluing instructing. Uh, I think that instructing is one of the most important you know, areas of expertise in our industry. And yet, for whatever reason, everybody views it as uh, transient because we don't compensate people enough uh, for them to make it a career in many cases. So the reality is our system is based around that because if you pay the instructors more, you have to charge the students more per hour. And, and then it becomes prohibitively expensive to many people as well. So a lot of um, what I hope we could do in the future, if we're able to create that center of excellence and to create like a, a sector ladder where we can define pathways into becoming a pilot is also to help people understand and navigate the, the costs of those factors as well. And, and to prioritize some of the most critical aspects of it, like the quality of the instructors. So I don't have a, a short answer to your question other than I completely understand where you're coming from. I don't think that there is anybody who is, um, you know, purposely trying to, uh, you know, do a poor job instructing. I think everybody goes to work trying to do the best job that they can. But the reality is that people are also self-motivated. So if they're not being compensated to a level and they want to move up in their career, then anybody is going to take that next step to try to move their life and their career forwards. Um, because of the pandemic, this issue is going to be less of an issue for the next two or three years because with everything sort of frozen and people laid off, um, it's one of those things where I actually hope that a lot of those schools who are maybe struggling to keep instructors can reach out to some of the more experienced aviation professionals and bring them in and say like, how can we close that gap between the way we teach and what airline skills are needed so that we're teaching people in the most efficient way possible. So uh, that question was absolutely critical to the point of causing some major problems in January. But I think that from where we are today for the next two years plus, uh, it's not going to be as big of a problem because the industry is a little bit different now. Awesome. Okay, we had a couple questions that you kind of talk, talked about um, as well. There was another question about the wage being an issue for instructors. Um, let me just, there's another one here. Uh, so my question for Dr. Kearns is how does she, uh, how does she see the use of unmanned aerial systems or the reduction of crews due to the, due to advanced auto, automations and cockpits affect the industry in the future? Yeah, so if you look back to the earlier days of aviation, it used to take five pilots to fly like a major airliner, right? Like there was a captain and first officer, there was the person who manned the radio and the navigator. Like there, there, it used to take five people and because of the increase of technology, we're now reduced down to two pilots, so the captain and the first officer. So it's not to say that there isn't precedent looking to our past that as technology increases, that it does reduce the number of pilots that are needed on the flight deck. When we were facing these like real critical personnel shortages, a lot of people were saying, well, that problem is going to solve itself because we'll just, you know, automate that aspect and, and those flights will be flown by only one pilot. Um, it's conceivable, like we have the technology where theoretically there could be a pilot on board and there, it could be, a, it's called a command and control, like a data link to a remote pilot station that maybe an airline runs on the ground and maybe there's like a bank of simulators and, and pilots sort of on call and then if something happens, they could jump in the sim and remotely fly that aircraft. Like it, it, the technology exists, it, obviously it's not being done today, um, but there are a few things that are going to limit that from happening anytime soon. Uh, sort of the international regulatory structure around how people are licensed and how airlines uh, must operate, or that's not going to be changing immediately. We don't have an ICAO annex that's around drone technologies yet. So there isn't sort of this international standardization of how the world is moving to to integrate drones into our airspace. It's sort of piecemeal. Countries are doing it independently. Um, there's also the, the issue of uh, passenger confidence. So one of the biggest economic drivers for an airline is that passengers feel comfortable and safe and confident to go on that flight. That's why after 9-11, nobody flew because everybody was afraid, even though, you know, realistically, there probably wasn't a threat after 9-11. So nobody was comfortable. So I, if you think about like, do people you know, would they be willing to fly on an aircraft that had no pilots? Like it was completely uh, flown autonomously or remotely. A lot of people still would say no. Um, so I think, I think that it's 
feasible to say that that the future of our industry you can never predict what's coming next like COVID taught us that like you never know you know what's coming down the corner but the reality is that there is a precedent to say that we have reduced the number of pilots on board a flight in the past and uh, one other quick thing is that if you talk to pilots a lot of pilots would think that it sounds pretty sad and depressing to sit in an airliner by yourself right like i think that that you know captain first officer experience like having somebody beside you there for those long journeys like that that's a really valuable thing and i think a lot of pilots would think it'd be pretty lonely a pretty miserable pretty long flight if you're just up there alone as well so again we'll see what the future holds yeah totally um can we have one last question um do you think there's a need for uh, a college of aviation professionals similar to a college of doctors and surgeons? Um, I, I know that there have been some initiatives around developing this in the past. I, you know, perhaps, I think any initiative to try to support young people and to support their transition into professional roles, I would think is a, is a good thing. Um, but I tend to look at it a little bit more broadly in that I don't think initiatives that focus just on one type of aviation professional are doing the best service to these broad population of students. I think the, that we need to be more integrated and holistic and less sort of uh, narrow. Um, that's not to say there aren't like unique challenges that, uh, you know, pilots group would, would be willing and, and would be needed to support. Um, but I would, you know, as, as you know from my presentation, I think that if we're going to take this on in a big way in Canada, that we need to take sort of a, a very broad cooperative approach to supporting the next generation and supporting the future of our sector. Okay, we have, we have time for one more question. <laughs> I just looked at the time. So let's do one last one. Um, sorry, give me one sec. Uh, my question is, how do you think we can address slash educate for careers that currently do not have an explicit degree slash field of study? Yeah, that's a great question. That's interesting, too, because because I so with the University of Waterloo as a quick example. Our aviation program is in either geography or science. So you do science and aviation or geography and aviation. So I'm an aviation prof, but I'm um, situated in the geography department. Um, but then people, as they, they want to study things that I'm interested in for my research at like grad students, they'll say like, I want to study aviation safety or human factors. And I said, like, I'm only able to supervise you in a geography degree, like that, because that's where I'm based. Um, so the academic system is not as flexible uh, in that sense, and that the, the degrees that you're doing are, are going to be unique to you know, what has been approved and established as a degree. Um, and that could be a real challenge as the industry is evolving really quickly to say, or how do we find educational programs to, as you said, to target or line people up for these new jobs? Um, because I'm in geography, we're actually in the Faculty of Environment. So I've taught aviation sustainability and I've learned a lot more about the environmental impacts of aviation. And for me, that was a really helpful education because uh, it became really clear that this is something that's really important to the future of our industry. But again, like there, we didn't have a degree program that's aviation sustainability. Like it, you have to go into something that's a little bit different and then you have to apply it to aviation. So I guess there's two ways to look at it, that there are a huge range of degree and education options in Canada. Uh, is there a way we could craft a common core that's like aviation topics and uh, sort of the equivalent of a minor? And then you could take sort of any degree with an aviation minor and we could start sort of uh, piecemealing together um, different educational programs. But, but again, we need that uh, sort of that broad cross-sectional approach to managing um, the future of our workforce, which I hope we get to. That's one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping we can achieve. Yeah, I would like to see that hopefully in the future as well. Um, so we'll just wrap everything up now. Um, I'd like to say thank you again to Dr. Suzanne Kearns for spending the hour with us and uh, to the viewers for tuning in today. I hope you all enjoyed uh, today's topic and we hope to see you again at our September webinar. So everybody, thank you and stay safe. <laughs>